Okay, it is my pleasure to introduce your presenter for today. Um, Drew Alexis represents employees in particular financial institutions, small employers, and nonprofit organizations, and individual employees in a right, wide range of employment disputes before federal and state courts and administrative agencies, including the areas of discrimination, harassment and retaliation, wrongful termination, constructive termination, wage and hour violations, breach of contract, fraud, defamation, and leave of absence law violations. He has both jury trial and appellate experience and has litigated employment cases for over 20 years. So he brings a wealth of knowledge to this topic. So it is my pleasure to go ahead and pass this over to you, Drew. Thank you very much, Robin, and thank you all for attending. I know how busy you all must be working at uh, animal sanctuaries. I used to be the general counsel uh, for Farm Sanctuary and, and serve as a board member and secretary to a nonprofit animal sanctuary. So I very much value your time and all the amazing contributions you make uh, to, to, the, to the world and to animals. And I'm happy to be here to help um, address issues you might have regarding employment law. Obviously, there's, there's uh, a lot to cover, and I can only, in a 45 minute period cover some very basic information, so that's what I'm going to try to do, and then leave 15 minutes for some questions. And of course, if anyone has questions following the presentation that are general in nature, um, you'll have my contact information as well uh, on, the, on the slides. Um, remember that legal advice can only really be obtained when there's an attorney-client relationship and there's consideration of the facts that may apply to a particular situation. And so the, the comments I'm giving here today are intended to be general in nature and not in intended to constitute specific legal advice to a particular situation um, uh, that you may be addressing. And of course, in addition to that, um, we remember that uh, living in the U.S., um, we have both federal, state, and local laws. And so um, obviously, I'm an attorney in California, and I'm very familiar with federal law as well as California law and some state laws, but any situation that you're dealing with really should be looked at from a perspective of uh, where the situation is arising, what state law or county or city city uh, law may govern in addition to federal law. So those are just some general comments I want to give. Um, you're all here, so you obviously care about employment law, and I just want to reiterate why we think it's why I think it's important that you should care and that nonprofits should care about employment laws. Uh, and I'll use some acronyms: NPO for nonprofit organizations. Um, there, a lot of nonprofits think they may be exempt from various employment laws, um, and that's just not true. Nonprofits are generally not exempt from federal and state and county employment laws, uh, and compliance can be complex. So it is important to, to think about these issues. Um, and of course, nonprofits typically need to have employees and independent contractors, not just volunteers, to operate effectively, particularly as you grow. Um, volunteers are wonderful. Um, I'm sure many of you have volunteered and or are volunteers and work with them, but they can also be limited in terms of their reliability. And so we find that nonprofits often need to have workforces um, that, uh, they're, that are operating the uh, operations effectively. So it's important to know the laws that govern uh, employees and contractors. Contractors. Um, and in, despite that uh, we like to think that everyone working for an animal sanctuary um, will get along well, will function well, will perform well, and have a terrific experience, that's not always true. Employees of nonprofits will, and they do sue their employers, and I've certainly been involved um, in lawsuits um, with nonprofits being sued um, for employment um, violations. Litigation can be embarrassing and really a PR nightmare, especially to a mission-driven nonprofit that focuses on on compassion and, and creating an image of goodwill, um, litigation by an, a current or former employee can really uh, cause concerns um, for donors, for example. And insurance may not cover liability, so it can be very expensive to be faced with employment litigation. And of course, of course, costs of non-complying with laws can be significant as well, not just litigation, but investigations by state agencies or the need to resolve and settle disputes, taking donor money, in essence, um, uh, to resolve an employment dispute can be an unfortunate use of money and can be expensive. Um, so I want to kind of give a general overview of, uh, why, again, on the same topic of, of what is an employment lawsuit? What do employees sue for when they do file lawsuits against nonprofits? And it's the same as in the for-profit world. There's contractual claims, tort claims, and statutory claims, and these can all be filed at various levels, both in federal and state courts before uh, federal and state administrative agencies like the Department of Labor or the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Um, more frequently by uh, employees 
employees in workers' comp appeals boards if there's a disputed injury claim, or, or in front of arbitration associations if the employer has an arbitration agreement with the employee that requires that they forego lawsuits in court, they can go to arbitration panels. And just some basic information about what these claims look like. Uh, contractual claims, employees typically sue for a breach of employment contract, although that's fairly rare because most employers don't have actual employment contracts with their employees, but some nonprofits actually do have those employment agreements. Um, they can sue for wrongful termination and breach of contract. If there is such an agreement and there's a lack of good cause to terminate, they can sue for breach of contract. Um, and breach of the covenant of good faith and fair dealing. Um, employees can sue if they're being terminated to avoid the vesting in a benefit. For example, if someone was about to vest in an employer match on a 403B and the employer got rid of the employee before that vesting occurred, uh, that could create a claim for breach of the covenant of good faith and fair dealing. Um, and, and there's also tort claims. Uh, tort claims are broader than contractual claims. They include things such as wrongful termination and violation of public policy, the intentional or negligent infliction of emotional distress, fraud or negligent misrepresentation made by the employer about the workplace, for example, or about the salary being paid to an employee, um, invasion of privacy if the employer is illegally searching uh, employee information, for example, uh, defamation. Uh, this comes up often when the employee leaves uh, and is terminated, and there may be some disclosure that both invades privacy of the former employee as well as makes it difficult for them to get another job. Um, and then assault battery and uh, sexual battery uh, can also be uh, filed as tort claims uh, against an employer. And the more concerning ones, of course, are the statutory claims. Um, the, the statutory claims are in these following areas. So there's the discrimination, harassment, and retaliation. There's both federal, state laws, and constitutional claims that can be asserted by employees. The federal laws include the ADA, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, and the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And m many of those cover larger organizations, um, and then state laws supplement that by covering some of the smaller organizations. So, for example, in California, we have a state law that it's broader than all of those uh, federal laws. Um, interference with, denial of, or retaliation for exercising a right to leave. Uh, again, there are a number of federal and state laws that authorize an employee to be absent from work, uh, the Family and Medical Leave Act being the, the most significant law. That only covers large employers. The ADA may provide for time off as an accommodation to someone who has a disability that requires some time off. There's a, a myriad of state leave of absence statutes all across the country, some of which actually require paid leave, the majority, however, of which require unpaid leave on a host of topics, including things such as literacy, education, rehabilitation for people who are addicted to drugs or have alcohol problems, time off to vote, time off to donate an organ or blood. There's various statutes that have to be considered. And then, of course, a recent trend is the adoption by states, cities, and counties of paid sick leave laws, uh, requiring that the employer provide paid sick leave to be used by the employee or to be used by the employee to care for an ill uh, family member. Um, and then another area of statutory claims employees file involve uh, claims for state and or federal wage and hour violations. This is probably the, what I see the most in nonprofits uh, because these laws typically, unlike some of the discrimination and leave of absence laws that may only cover smaller employers, these laws typically cover all employers, including nonprofits. Um, and and com their complex requirements uh, in, in the wage and hour field. And so these laws include the FLSA, the Fair Labor Standards Act, and I'm going to talk a bit about that uh, later as well because that's about to change. Um, and then there's, of course, state minimum wage and minimum salary laws. There's state meal and rest period laws. Uh, for which employers can pay penalties for noncompliance, uh, state expense reimbursement requirements, wage deduction laws, what you can and can't take from an employee's pay and how you have to have authorization, for example, and then pay statement and pay date laws. Uh, there are some employers that accidentally pay too late um, after the close of the pay period, um, and so uh, they may be facing penalties for doing so. So these laws are also very important to be aware of. 
And recovery can be extensive um, by employees. So on the contract claims, it's not as extensive. It's usually limited to back pay, unpaid future wages, bonuses, interest, things that were deprived under the terms of a contract. So these are not the exciting claims that lawyers are looking to pursue. Lawyers would rather pursue tort claims because those allow for those same recoveries of of lost wages, um, as well as emotional distress damages, which are fairly nebulous and and can potentially be a lot of money if, if a decision really was very, very troubling and required someone to get counseling, for example. Um, And punitive damages and nonprofits can, of course, still be obligated to pay punitive damages if their behavior or conduct was particularly egregious or malicious towards an employee. And so a lawyer would love those claims, and even better if they can bring a statutory claim, because under the various statutes I've talked about, they can get all of those damages that they can get under contract and tort theories. And in addition, the attorney can get their fees paid by the employer. Um, And depending on the statute, there could be civil or other penalties, even even criminal penalties, as well as in certain cases what are called liquidated damages, which can be double or triple the actual damages. Um, And all of these penalty and liquidated damage provisions are designed to really ensure that employers are complying with the law and create an additional incentive or punishment um, uh, so that employees uh, uh, do so uh, very carefully. So um, employers' costs can be fairly extensive, which is why it's important to think about and comply with these laws. Um, even if the employer prevails in a lawsuit, the costs can be extremely expensive. Nonprofit attorney fees can easily and quickly exceed $100,000. Um, I've certainly represented nonprofits. I've worked with other firms that have represented them. And, it's, and certainly if you can get pro bono work from some of the larger firms, that's terrific. But it can be difficult, depending on where the lawsuit is filed um, and the nature of the claim um, to find pro bono support to take on litigation. And and discounted rates can be available, but still the fees can fairly quickly exceed 100000 And then just as important is the loss of time, uh, the time spent by the executive directors, coworkers, possibly donors and volunteers, depending on the nature of the claim, in depositions, um, in discovery responses, in, in a trial. In one case I handled, there were declarations provided by perhaps 20 volunteers And so think of the idea of your volunteers being um, solicited to provide a declaration to support an employee that can also create a PR nightmare, Um, and donors um, as well. Bad publicity, that's certainly a financial cost. Uh, Nonprofits treat animals well, but not their human employees well is not a statement you would want to be said about an animal sanctuary, Um, but certainly employment litigation can lead to people raising those kinds of concerns and questions that it's wonderful for animals but abusive to human employees. And so that's another reason to care about this. Uh, Nonprofits may be at risk if they do have insurance to cover them. They may be at risk of losing the insurance uh, and or having a significant increase in the cost that they pay for that insurance. So I worked with in one case where a nonprofit actually had to pay out its insurance and uh, as a result of it was not able to get that insurance in the future. So that creates a real risk if there's a future claim. Um, Copycat claims is also another possible financial risk to the employer. Um, It's not uncommon for there to be one dispute followed by another and another, particularly if there's a policy that's being challenged or a practice that's applicable to all employees that's being challenged. It wouldn't be uncommon for an employee to follow suit of another employee. Um, And another effect on the um, nonprofit is that it has a chilling effect on management. Um, Managers may be afraid to manage employees who are in the middle of a lawsuit, uh, or they may be afraid to manage. They may be afraid to make important decisions like terminating someone for fear of a lawsuit, and those are not good reasons to not terminate um, necessarily, and so it can have a chilling effect on the ability to to really have a cooperative workforce. Um, And of course, managers and individuals can be sued personally on a number of the claims that I've talked about. Managers, executive directors, coworkers can be sued for harassment, any of the tort claims for defamation, invasion of privacy, infliction of emotional distress. Uh, Managers, including HR managers, can be sued if they violate the Family Medical Leave Act by failing to provide um, someone with a leave of absence, and they can face penalties and liquidated damages under FMLA violations. And even for for wage and hour violations, even the failure to pay minimum wage, the failure to pay overtime, the failure to provide meal and rest breaks can result in individual um, owners or managers or founders and board members um, from being uh, personally liable on similar such claims. 
Now, even if they're not sued personally, uh, employment litigation, as I mentioned, it makes it very difficult for an executive director or manager to do his or her job. Um, and it can be difficult just in general. Of course, if they've done something wrong, managers, executive directors can be disciplined or terminated um, as a result of, of uh, their actions uh, having on litigation. Um, it may Litigation may require a substantial amount of the manager's time, preventing them from doing the important work that they're supposed to be doing. It may create hostile or stressful, stressful relations with other employees. And of course, as I noted, litigation by a current employee may make it difficult to manage that employee and almost impossible to fire that employee because that employee will then claim that they've been retaliating against. So those are all the horrible things um, that we like to, I like to point out as reasons why it's important to think about employment law and to be sure that you're operating in a way where you're minimizing to the extent possible um, and reasonable all the employment risks that you take. Obviously, you can't eliminate them entirely by virtue of having employees and by virtue of having independent contractors. You will face um, risk um, in the employment area if you don't, uh, even for example, term termination decisions, even a very good termination decision can still create risk. But there's ways to reduce the likelihood of employment claims and reduce the cost of them once they're filed. And I wanted to kind of go through some of the key steps that I always tell small nonprofits when they're starting, in particular to think about, um, even if they don't have that internal HR resource, someone who's dedicated to just doing HR, um, someone needs to be responsible for, for following some of these steps. Step one is have a good employee handbook. Um, and, and this is really crucial. What is a good employee handbook. A good employee handbook is one that confirms the at-will nature of employment. At-will means that um, you can be an employee can be fired um, or have a change in his or her job responsibilities, job title, salary, etc. For any reason or no reason, even a horribly stupid reason, um, they just can't be have those changes made because of an unlawful reason. And it, it means very little, unfortunately, for the employer, but it helps the lawyer, if there is litigation, for there to be an at-will uh, provision in the employee handbook because it helps reduce certain aspects of claims like contractual claims. So it's important to have a handbook that lets people know that they're at-will employees. Um, the, a good handbook also should provide all relevant policies uh, that employees are to, are to follow and be held accountable to. If you plan on disciplining and ultimately terminating someone, either through a progressive discipline process or, or, or otherwise, then it's important to have a policy um, in general that, ex that, that you can use to support that decision, that you can refer the employee to in a written counseling or in a termination memo. You violated XYZ policy by doing the following and not doing the following. That certainly strengthens the termination, especially if it's a handbook that's been distributed. If it's a policy that no one ever saw or knew about, obviously it's useless. But a good handbook is one that's acknowledged by the employees as having been received um, and is available to them to consult with. Um, and certainly having a policy that you follow also helps with consistency to make sure that um, like situations are being treated in the same way so that you're avoiding claims such as discrimination. For example, if a male um, is treated one way and then a female does the same thing and she's terminated, that creates concerns about discrimination. So having good, clear policies uh, for employees to follow. A good handbook also identifies the employer's equal employment opportunity responsibilities, including, and this is perhaps the most important thing in a handbook, a harassment complaint and investigation procedure. That has to be very thoroughly drafted in an employee handbook. What do I do as an employee if I feel that my manager or a coworker or somebody um, is harassing me on the basis of a protected classification? And a good EEO policy lists out all of those protected classifications, race, gender, age, religion, sexual orientation, all of those that are, that are covered by state, local laws, and of course, federal law as well. Um, and the harassment complaint procedure has to have certain key language in it that allows employees not just to go to their supervisor, but to go elsewhere. If my supervisor is the one harassing me, for example, I need another outlet to be able to report my concerns. Is it to the board? Is it to the board chair? Um, or is it to HR if there is an HR department? Um, and an investigation procedure. I need to be placed on notice as an employee about what you're going to do when I make that complaint. Are you going to keep it confidential? Are you going to investigate it? How promptly? And are you going to get back to me af after you do the investigation? So that's a really important policy to identify in your employee handbook. 
Um, a good employee handbook also identifies all leave of absence rights, um, including the right to sick leave and or vacation if it's required by law. And of course, there's no law yet that requires paid vacation, but certainly there are laws that require paid sick leave. Um, or if you're offering sick leave and vacation, um, a good handbook will state what the terms of that are. Um, you know, what's payable at termination, for example. Um, is there a cap on accrual or usage in a year, for example? Those things should be clearly identified with respect to paid sick leave and vacation or PTO if you combine the two as, as one. Um, and in addition, a handbook should identify after reviewing the particular state or states where you're operating the, le the unpaid leave of absence laws that you have to comply with uh, and that employees have a right to time off for um, and the terms of taking time off for things such as witness duty or jury duty or bereavement leave um, or those other areas. And remember, if you have multiple locations, so for example, if you're in California and you're also in Washington State and you're also in New York, uh, that the handbook should really identify those rights that employees have in each of those particular states. Um, and a, a good handbook will also avoid, this is a contract language. The handbook is not a contract. Um, it's just a tool. It is a tool to communicate important information to the employee that they need to know to be part of the workforce. Um, and so disclaimers in the, con in the handbook are important. Um, and a good handbook is one that stays current. Um, employment law changes regularly, and particularly um, at the state level, more so than at the federal level. Um, and, and there's constantly new laws being added. As I mentioned, there's trends now. The most recent trends in em employment law relate to the increase in salary salary and minimum wage requirements, the institution of paid sick leave and paid family leave programs, um, and changes with respect to the ability to ask about criminal backgrounds, as well as the ability to ask an applicant about um, their salary, their prior salaries uh, in connection with hiring decisions. So as laws change, it's important that the handbook be updated, and I always say you should, you should update it annually, or at least have it reviewed by an HR professional or a lawyer annually to determine whether there's anything that needs to change. Um, and finally, a good handbook serves as a roadmap for compliance in key areas, um, such as meal and rest periods. If you're in one of the states that has very detailed meal and rest period requirements, such as New York or California or Illinois, then your handbook needs to reflect that and tell employees what the policies are, what their rights are to those breaks. Uh, because in certain states, such as California and Washington, employees can sue for not getting those breaks, and they can seek damages and penalties for uh, a up to four years in California for not getting a meal or rest break. Um, and it should serve as a roadmap for compliance with respect to work hours and overtime. Um, a good handbook should make it clear that non-exempt hourly workers are not expected and, and are not permitted to work off the clock, that they can only um, be, they must be on the clock in order to perform work and that you do pay overtime. And this is a, a troubling issue sometimes for nonprofits um, because they, they wish that employees might work their eight-hour day if they're in California or their 40-hour work week and then, quote, unquote, volunteer that additional time in lieu of getting overtime. And that's generally not accepted by a federal or state law. There are certain exceptions to that, and it, it's really driven by state law here. If, for example, I'm a non-exempt employee and my job is clerical in nature, I'm in an office and I'm communicating with donors and volunteers by email and phone, and there's an event on the weekend um, where I might need the, they need volunteers to help clean a barn, I might be in a position as a non-exempt employee to volunteer to do that because it's completely outside the course and scope of my regular job and not be entitled to overtime compensation uh, for that time as long as it's clear that, that that's what the parties intend. But nevertheless, a good handbook should identify the requirements for paying overtime and those situations where if an employee truly volunteers outside of the course and scope of their regular position um, as a volunteer, then they wouldn't receive that compensation and that should be looked at from the perspective of the particular state laws that in the states where you operate.
So where can you find this Good Employee Handbook that I keep talking about? Well, there's a couple ways. Um, one, you could certainly, if you don't have an HR person, hire a local HR consultant um, or an employment attorney in your state. HR consultants are generally less expensive than employment lawyers, and you may be able to, again, find a pro bono employment attorney to help you. Um, if you can't find them that easily, um, join a local or state chamber of commerce. Um, you can get um, handbook templates and the employer posters that you're required to post in the workplace place um, from a local or state chamber of commerce. These are great, great resources out there that nonprofits sometimes don't utilize. Um, and of course, if you do receive an employee handbook in that manner, you definitely will need to customize it. So it might be good to then, you know, at least work with an HR consultant or employment attorney to do any customization that you want to do. Don't just ask your friend at another organization, please send me your employee handbook. Uh, one, it may be proprietary and that friend may be violating a confidential policy in that other company and may not have a right to send it and, and, and could face disciplinary action. And two, you don't have any assurance that that, that handbook is compliant with the law um, if it's just sent to you by a friend that works at another organization. That organization may not have done the right steps um, to make sure they have a good employee handbook. So I, I don't recommend just getting one from another organization. Um, I think there's too, too many risks associated with that. In addition to having a good employee handbook, my key step two is have good standardized forms um, that you're using um, to, treat the, to treat the ordinary employment actions that take place. Employment application and offer letters are, are important, so make sure you have a good one. Make sure your employment application asks the right questions and doesn't ask the questions you're not entitled to ask in your particular state. Uh, if you have disclaimers that you require in the application, such as at will or arbitration, language about falsification, language about a background and or drug testing, make sure that the application complies with the state law and that those disclaimer provisions are adequately stated. Um, and of course, a good offer letter template is very valuable. Don't hire anyone on an, on a, on an oral verbal discussion. It, um, certainly, it should be very documented in an offer letter that sets forth the key terms and conditions of employment. I have a really good template I drafted for nonprofits, so if anyone wants a template, of an offer letter, I could certainly send that. Again, that's based on California, but it's fairly standard, so I think it would probably serve a good purpose. Um, hourly employee timesheets. Hopefully, your hourly workers are tracking their time, and that's key in order to be able to pay them properly, and you have to, by law, track their time. Their time in in the morning, their time out for a lunch break, their time back after lunch is over, and their time at the end of the day should be tracked. Um, and it's important to have a good timesheet that also has the right disclaimer language language, so that by signing, I'm, I'm confirming that my time is accurate, that I've um, uh, not worked off the clock, that I've received all meal and or rest breaks to which I'm entitled under, under the employer's policy. So language of that nature. There should be a place there for approval of overtime um, so that if they are working overtime, it can be properly identified in the timesheet and that supervisor is signing that the overtime was approved. That also helps com with compliance if there's ever a claim that someone's not getting overtime if you show there was a procedure. Uh, for approval of overtime. A leave of absence request and related forms. So if you if you are covered in states that require that you provide leave of absence, whether it's pregnancy or family medical leave, jury duty, et cetera, um, having a, re a good request form that lists all of the leaves for which an employee may be eligible, where they can simply check a box and turn the form in. A good leave of absence request form will have also some good disclaimer language about the importance of providing documentation that may be required to verify the leave. Um, so if it's a, a pregnancy disability, are you asking for medical certification. If it's um, a family care leave, are you asking for a doctor's note confirming that the employee needs the time off to care for the family member? If it's jury duty, are you getting a copy of the summons and some record that they're actually attending court proceedings? So a leave of absence form can, can kind of identify what they're required to do in connection with their leave, as well as also make it clear um, whether you're going to require that they use um, available and accrued paid vacation or sick leave to cover for the leave or if you're not going to require it, whether you're uh, allowing them to do so. And certain laws um, require that you let employees utilize accrued available leave. So it's important to kind of specify all that in these forms. Um, 
meal period waiver forms in the states that require meal periods. There are many of those states, with I believe the exception of New York, allows the meal period to be waived under certain circumstances. And so if you're in a state that has a meal period requirement, um, if, if an employee wishes to waive that, you really should have that uh, in writing and you should use a form that's written in a way to ensure that the waiver does is voluntary. Of course, it has to be voluntary. You can't force someone to waive a meal period. Um, and uh, that they, they're signing that they understand their rights and they're choosing to not take that meal period. That's an important form. Um, Makeup time request form. If you are in a, if you're in California, you should have a makeup time request form. If for those employees that are going to work more than eight hours in a day, to make up time missed in the work week without triggering overtime. Um, and then PIPs and counseling forms. It's a really good idea to have a standard form that you use if you're going to put people on a performance improvement plan. Have a good template for what that plan should look like, so that every time you're going to put someone on a performance improvement plan, you're using that same template, um, and and that's key. And the same thing with written counseling forms. Um, um, there's uh, separate forms that are utilized for both of those, and I certainly have templates of those too. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> okay, step three: um, make sure you have good trained, a good trained executive director and, and managers. Um, and and so I had some thoughts on this. A, a good manager is someone who hires based on the needed knowledge, skills, and abilities. Um, I have found that times that nonprofits don't do a good job of necessarily assessing th those traits that make a successful employee in a role. They just a volunteer comes in, they seem great, great, we'll bring them on, or it's a friend um, or someone else in the movement. Um, and so that's not the way to hire someone. Um, it's not who you like or who you know. It's who you need based on the knowledge, skills, and abilities. And so make sure the job description is clear and that the manager is hiring based on those needed KSAs. Um, and a good manager shouldn't just walk away then and assume the employee is going to do a great job. Um, the manager must ensure that the employees have all the resources and tools that they need to perform the job, including ongoing training that may be required, um, uh, information that they may need about a particular animal, for example, or condition, a particular procedure that is going to need to be performed. Um, there should be resources for training um, for employees as well. Um, a good manager should work with employees to set measurable and reasonable goals for judging performance. It's not okay to go a whole year without conversations with your, with your employees about their performance. Um, people really value feedback, um, positive feedback, and of course, in particular, but even constructive criticism. Um, if you're waiting till the end of the year to tell someone they did a horrible job throughout the year and you didn't give them that those conversations earlier in the year to help them understand and possibly engage in some corrective work to, to get up to those goals, you're doing them a disservice. Um, and so setting measurable and reasonable goals for judging performance very early on is very valuable. And consider doing it on a quarterly basis or every six months, uh, for example, so that you can it forces you to have conversations with your employees throughout uh, specific times in the year. I don't always think it's good to just wait till the end of the year for these performance reviews, but everyone hates them anyway. So I I suggest doing it on a more regular basis. A good manager should also make sure that he that he gets he or she gets training for him or herself on leadership and on how to motivate and coach and counsel employees. Um, oftentimes, uh, nonprofits get people who are great at a job, and when they're great at a job and a manager leaves, they the best person who was performing under the manager all of a sudden becomes the manager. Um, and being great at at what you're doing is good, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have the skills to then manage other people uh, to do the same thing just because you know how the job is done. There's a, there are certain characteristics and traits uh, involved in leadership and motivating and coaching and counseling. And so managers need that kind of training, whether you bring someone in from HR to do a training um, or you, you, there's certainly many resources available, um, books and literature about this that you can require managers to read uh, and, and come up with a training program for themselves. Um, a good manager should hold employees accountable for misconduct or performance that's poor in a timely manner. The worst thing to do is to wait when dealing with these things um, because when you wait, um, unfortunately, either the facts are not as clear, you didn't have an opportunity to retain a particular document or piece of information that was important to a counseling, um, or something happened in, in the intervening time that makes it more difficult to counsel them, like they they develop a disability and need to go on a short-term leave, 
um, or they make a complaint of harassment, and now you're trying to discipline them after those events, and and so they could claim retaliation. That the discipline is really not performance related; it's it's in retaliation for my recent complaint or my recent um, leave of absence. And a good manager timely documents important employment actions. So the, the same thing, I'm holding people accountable and documenting uh, in the right form, in a PIP, in a counseling, um, on a timely manner is, is, is very valuable. What else? And despite at-will employment that I talked about before, a good manager is one who gives notice and opportunity before making termination decisions. Um, I'm always looking at recommendations from my clients to fire people, and I, I, they, and I've had clients say, but that we're at-will, and I say, well, let me see what you've done to notify the employee of the problem. Obviously, if it's something that notice isn't necessary, like someone brings a gun to work and shoots a coworker, that you don't have to tell them you shouldn't have done that. Don't do it again if it's that severe, of course. But barring anything illegal, if the employee is engaging in some misconduct um, and or doing a poor job, then courts, juries in particular, don't understand that will. And they expect that you've been fair and reasonable. And that means you give someone notice. You tell them promptly what it is that they're not doing well and how it is they can fix it. And you give them an opportunity to improve. And so that's the intent of these performances performance improvement plans. If someone is doing a poor job, um, you have to determine how much time must I give them um, to improve based on the nature of the deficiency. Maybe it's 30 days, maybe it's 60, 90, maybe it's just a week. And, and really notify them what the problem is and give them an opportunity. If during that period they continue to make the same mistakes or engage in the same misconduct, it'll be much easier to come back to say, okay, now we need to terminate you. We gave you this opportunity and it hasn't worked. Um, and so now we're taking termination action. Juries understand that and they appreciate that more. Okay, a good manager is also someone who takes action consistent with the handbook and other policies. I mentioned the importance of a handbook and policy. It's important to follow the, the language in there. So if, if you have an attendance policy that says, I have a client now that has an attendance policy that says five minutes, um, if you come to work five minutes late, you, you're tardy. And that's fine. It's legal, but is it really is it really something you're going to enforce? And are you not risking selective enforcement because you know, especially in a place like LA where there's so much traffic? And so I I told them in this one case they shouldn't enforce that policy because there was evidence of too many other people in the same department coming in late to work. And why are you singling that person out given your policy? So make sure your policy is of course reasonable, and in addition, then follow your policy. Don't just follow it for the one person who's under the microscope because you don't you're angry at them at the moment. Follow it for all of your employees. Um, and that leads to the last point, which is a good manager does take action that's consistent with treatment of like cases. That's the best way to avoid claims of discrimination, retaliation, is to ensure that, that you're taking the same approach to addressing discipline or conduct with one employee than you are with another. And if you're not, then you need to be able to articulate a legitimate, non-discriminatory, non-retaliatory reason for treating two things differently and make sure that, that that's that sounds reasonable and that appears to be uh, a reasonable basis for treating two things uh, differently. Okay, um, <clears throat> number four, my key step number four um, is ensure you have EPLI. Um, I'm not sure if you have uh, if, if folks uh, have visibility to their insurance policy, but EPLI is Employment Practice Liability Insurance. It's usually part of your D&O coverage, your directors and officers coverage. And so it's very valuable insurance because it can help you if you are sued by an employee um, or you receive a demand letter from an employee's attorney threatening a lawsuit. If you have insurance that would cover the cost of the defense um, and get you an attorney, um, usually at, uh, paid by by the carrier. Um, and so definitely look into EPLI. If you have it, make sure that the deductible is not too high. If the deductible is 250000 for example, that means you're on the hook for the first 250000 of legal costs before the insurance carrier picks up the rest. Um, and so you want a relatively low deductible. Um, and also, you would make sure that it covers workers' comp retaliation claims. Um, some states have this procedure where employees can sue for retaliation um, in the workers' comp appeals board setting and 
your, and ETLI policies don't automatically cover that. If they don't cover those retali- workers' comp retaliation claims, then you're, then you're stuck getting another lawyer involved and paying money to a lawyer for some bogus retaliation claim in the workers' comp setting. But if you have ETLI, you may be able to get the insurance carrier, the workers' comp carrier, to also cover the retaliation claim through that ETLI. Um, the next step is conduct regular HR-related trainings. Um, it, it, you know, I don't know. Everyone has a limited budget for training, but training is valuable. Training can be required. Like training for certain employers um, for harassment is required in California. But even if not required, having an annual training or a training at hire, for example, and a record that you keep of that training is really valuable to show that you're taking appropriate steps to inform the workforce of what's permitted and what's prohibited and what people can do when they have complaints. So the trainings that I think are valuable are um, harassment for sure. Uh, Anti-bullying training is another their key uh, training to provide, um, and possibly training of manager. Well, training of managers on meal and rest period compliance, as well as uh, on overtime and uh, wage and hour issues, and also conduct regular audits. Um, this is a valuable thing if you have a staff person. If you ha- are have an auditor, an outside auditor, they they rarely if ever know the wage and hour requirements uh, or the other employment law requirements. They're looking more for things relating to documenting of board meetings um, and financial transactions and uh, accounting. They're not looking at compliance with complex employment laws. So don't assume that your regular outside audit firm if, when they give you a clean bill of health on your on your financials, has any knowledge of your HR risks and liabilities, and so it's important to think about doing an audit. You know, for example, do you, do, do a personnel file audit? See if your personnel files are well organized and have the relevant documents. Do an I nine audit. Are you are you ensuring that all of your workers have legal documentation to be working? Um, doing doing a timesheet audit to make sure that employees are properly recording their time. Um, those can help you identify identify areas of risk where you might need to have some attention and training uh, or in policy development. Um, Hire an experienced HR manager and director if you can afford it. Or spend resources on the person you're going to make responsible for HR to get training. Um, so many nonprofits don't have the funds to hire a senior level HR director. And so what they do is they have like a chief administrative officer, chief operations officer. Make sure that person, if you're not using an HR director, it gets some is accountable for HR compliance and gets the outside training that he or she needs to, to do the job well. Of course, hire an attorney to advise on risky terminations if you're if you're facing a risky termination. Um, I also recommend spending money on proper background checks if you're going to bring in employees. Um, it, it, you're bringing them, you're trusting them into uh, into your home in essence, and so it's important to think about who you're bringing in and what information you might need uh, in connection with uh, making a hiring decision of someone you don't know. And so background checks can be really valuable. And lastly, at termination, I also think it's important to think about severance and release agreements. These can be really valuable ways to minimize risk and pay some severance. I've worked with a nonprofit that automatically paid two weeks of severance to everyone they fired. And I thought that doesn't make sense. If you're not getting a release from them, you're just giving away money. Why would you do that? If you're going to give away money like that, especially because it's donor money, um, why not get them to sign a release of claims so that they can't come back to you and sue you for something else? I've I've worked with employers that have paid severance, didn't get a release, and then still got sued. So don't assume you're creating goodwill just by giving people money uh, as severance. If you want to give severance, do it in connection with an agreement by which the employee releases all claims that can legally be released against you. Um, and always be ready for change. Um, federal employment laws don't change frequently, and state laws do, but note a big change is coming to the Fair Labor Standards Act on December 1 of 2016. Um, and in that regard, it's the salary level. The salary level you're paying for exempt, what are called white-collar exempt employees, professionals, executives, administrative, and computer-exempt employees, it's increasing substantially. It's Right now, it's 23660 which is about $400 a, a, a week, and it's changing um, from 455 a week to 913 a week, or $47,476, or $3,956 monthly. And that means if you have employees 
employee is covered by the Fair Labor Standards Act um, and they're salaried employees and they're exempt, meaning they don't receive overtime when they work more than 40 hours in a week or in California more than eight hours in a day, you need to make sure you're paying them at or above this new level um, by December 1, 2016, or you're going to have to increase their salary or reclassify them to non-exempt. Um, and I said uh, that's only if you're covered by the FLSA. Well, the FLSA covers nonprofit corporations. There's two tests that the FLSA looks at to cover organizations. One is, is a revenue test. Um, and nonprofits usually don't meet the revenue test, which is you have to generate revenue of at least $500,000 a year. And because you're charitable in nature, you're typically not generating that revenue um, because you're providing charitable services. But if you have unrelated business income tax because you're operating a gift shop and you reach that level, then, of course, you would be regulated as an enterprise. But if you're not regulated as an enterprise, your individual employees, regardless of whether you're regulated, can still be covered by the FLSA. There's a good article uh, written by the Department of Labor. If anyone wants it, it's called Guidance for Nonprofit Organizations on Paying Overtime under the Fair Labor Standards Act. And it notes that individual employees may be covered if they're engaging in interstate commerce. And engaging in interstate commerce includes activities such as making out-of-state phone calls, receiving or sending interstate mail or electronic communications, ordering or receiving goods from an out-of-state supplier, and handling credit card and transactions or performing accounting or bookkeeping for such activities. And so those are some pretty common things that a lot of people do, right? making, making out-of-state calls or receiving uh, or, or sending email that goes out of state. If, if, if your employees are doing that, um, then they're covered by the FLSA and you need to make sure you're covering, paying them the right salary. And of course, in addition to the federal law that's changing, state, county, and city laws do change more frequently, and so be on the lookout in the future for changes and increases. Minimum wage is going up in places like New York and California. Minimum salary for white-collar exempt employees is going up. In California, by 2022, to have someone exempt, you'll have to pay them a salary of $62,400. That's going to go up from what it is now, $41,600, uh, incrementally from 2000. 2017 to 2022. As I mentioned, paid sick leave um, and uh, paid family care leave is, is starting to be looked at, and then uh, limitations on certain background checks are coming. So how do you stay on top of these changes? Well, one, join a local HR organization or Chamber of Commerce. Chambers of Commerce are great resources for learning about this. Two, sign up for an employment law firm blog. You can get sign up very easily on uh, some of the major law firms that publish um, annual, monthly, daily even blogs on changes in the law. Um, have your HR person join SHRM, which is the Society for Human Resource Management, or other professional organizations. SHRM is a great resource on changing HR laws. And of course, try to get a local pro bono uh, attorney to give you advice from time to time. So I want to open it up um, to any questions. We have about 15 minutes left, and I'm happy to take whatever questions I can. Thank you, Drew. Um, I'd like to, to let everybody know, please feel free to type in any questions you have in the chat box. Um, there, Carol, I saw your question. I think that's probably definitely one for Kelly, and I know she's on the call, so she should see that. And while I give you a chance to go ahead and type in your questions, um, I will go ahead. I know I want to unmute Kelly. Oh, and I see that someone, I'm glad you posted that Department of Labor guidance that I mentioned. I'm glad you posted that. So that's a good resource for people. Thank okay. you for doing Kelly, that. Kelly, I think you might be unmuted. Think, is that correct? Yeah, I think, I think I'm unmuted. Hi, everybody. This is Kelly Heckman. Hi, Kelly. Um, thank, I just wanted to get unmuted, number one, first to say thank you, Drew, for that. That was really informative, and I think... Um, definitely will be a resource that a lot of our sanctuaries are going to be able to really use for a while now. Right. And um, so, yeah, so I think there is some interest in your, your template documents and even kind of uh, thinking about how they might be specific to sanctuaries. So I'd, I'd love to chat with you about what we can do to sure. make that easier for the sanctuaries to get a hold of. And if that's, you know, posting them on our website or just, you know, we'll have them as a resource as they need. Um, either way is fine with us, but yeah, it was great. And I, yeah, if there's any questions, please um, chat, uh, write them up in the chat box. And um, 
if it was so thorough and you don't have any questions, but something pops in your head later on, um, feel free to, to email those questions to Robin, or, you know, you can email them to Drew directly and, um, and we'd be happy to help you get those answers. And please, if you do email me directly, just copy Robin, if you don't mind. If, I mean, I ask Kelly that they do that. That way you have a record of, of the kind of questions That's that good. come up. And I'll also say I'm happy to do other – I love helping nonprofits. I'm happy to do other um, webinars as needed on any uh, HR issue. The other thing I do a lot of uh, presentations on is charitable solicitation regulations, both the state uh, regulations on charitable solicitation. So I'm happy to do something like that in the future as well. Yes, no, we're, we're definitely going to keep using Drew because he's number one willing. And, and yeah, this is all very important information that we all need. So, so yeah, everyone, thank you for attending. And uh, I'll turn it back again. Thank you to Drew. And I'll turn it back over to Robin to, to wrap it up, unless we get any questions. Perfect. Thank you. And I do want to mention, Drew and I had talked a little bit um, earlier about um, doing something on volunteers because I know so many of our groups have large numbers of volunteers or maybe volunteer only. So, you know, if there's other topics that are important to you or you'd like to see, you know, delved in more deeply, please feel free to let us know because we're so appreciative that, that Drew has uh, offered to help out because I know this information is so important to all of you. I'd be happy to do one on volunteers, and I would want to combine that with independent contractors um, and consultants when you bring people on and you're paying them, but you're not paying them as an employee, you're paying them as a contractor. There's some legal issues there to be mindful of as well. So I would combine those two. That's perfect. Great. I appreciate that. Well, it looks like we're good to go. Um, I want to say thank you again, Drew, for a great presentation, and thank you to everybody for attending today. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free you know, to email Drew and copy me on them, and we'll see what we can do about getting you those documents also. So thank you again, Drew, and thank you, everybody, for attending. My pleasure. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye, everyone.